Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts, losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's broadcast is the second part of a two-part show on free speech and the responses to the worst of speech out there. Already some feedback coming in on part one, which aired yesterday, and today we're going to get into even more of these discussions. I've got activist Dan Errol queued up for our first conversation. Later on, I've got Thomas Smith of the Serious Inquiries Only broadcast. I've got more of your calls and emails on the show. Continue the discussion with us as we talk about the First Amendment, the Constitution, the letter of the law, and the response to hate speech in the United States of America. First, I want to say a huge thanks out to our show sponsor at Stamps.com. Stamps.com has made it ridiculously easy for anybody to mail any letter or ship any package using official U.S. postage without the hassle of the post office, without the drive, the long lines or the expensive postage meters. From your own desk, you can mail any letter or package without the hassle 24 hours a day. And I use Stamps.com in my own life, and I have for many years. Whether I'm shipping out books and mugs or whatever for speaking tours or just paying bills that still require actual forms, and they do exist, sending a birthday card or a gift to a friend of mine who lives out of town, Stamps.com gives me all the services of the U.S. Post Office right at my fingertips. And right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitments. So go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Seth Andrews. That's stamps.com. Enter Seth Andrews. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. If you're listening to the show today, I certainly hope that you have heard the first part of the broadcast, which aired yesterday for the first time, and you can find it easily. I will link it in the description box. If you haven't heard part one, please go back and start there. It provides some good groundwork and some context for many of the things that we're speaking about today. But in a nutshell, much of what we're talking about came to light because of an event that happened on the day of Donald Trump's inauguration. There was a white supremacist named Richard Spencer who was doing an interview on camera for uh, an Australian media corporation. And during the interview, he was punched in the face by somebody. And of course, we have seen people square off on both sides of the issue. Is it okay to punch Richard Spencer for spewing ugly ideas? Or is he protected under the Constitution in a nation that guarantees free speech? My first interview on the show today is with an activist named Dan Errol. In January of this year, he published an article... Should we be okay with punching Nazis? Let me just read a portion of the article. Dan Errol says this, Should Nazis have free speech? The U.S. basically says yes. Germany says no. Now, I don't think Germany is less free because of this, and I doubt its non-Nazi citizens do either. However, this is not a free speech issue. Spencer has the right to speak on the street corner. He did, and he paid the price for it. The government did not arrest him for his speech. No violation of his speech was had. Free speech is not free of consequences. A single activist interrupted Spencer's speech. He was, by all accounts, free to continue his interview after he had chosen to do so. Again, what you say has consequences. Was it legal for the Antifa activist to punch him? No. Does that make it morally wrong? I say no. Sometimes laws don't work. Sometimes things are not black and white. Nazis are not sharing an opposing view. They are literally advocating for the erasure of entire races. This is not a debate between should health care be free or at a premium. This debate is whether people of color have a right to be alive. 
If you think that's just an opposing view, you're part of the problem that contributed to the resurgence of Nazism. And with that, I will lead into the first interview with the broadcast. Dan Errol is an activist and an author. He hosts the Danthropology website, and he has been kind of a lightning rod for some of these discussions, some of the more controversial ones on social media recently. Dan's been on the show in the past, and we've talked about things like secular parenting, and I think we've talked about the Ark Encounter and some other stuff. But recently, most of the conversations you've been having have been about other things, much of it relating to the conversation we're having today about free speech and when the use of physical force is appropriate. Dan Errol, what do you think? Well, I think first and foremost, free speech is incredibly important. As far as uh, I don't want our government making decisions on free speech. I don't want our government making decisions on what is good or bad speech, because that's all going to rely upon whoever is in charge. So I think from that perspective, we need to protect free speech. Outside of that, I think society has its own role in deciding what it's willing to tolerate and put up with as far as, you know, hate speech being spread and and white nationalism and things like that. And so I think what we're seeing today is a a reaction to that. Do you think it's okay to punch a Nazi? So, yes, uh, if we're staying specifically with Nazis. Uh, I don't How do you it's define okay to, a Nazi? Let's someone who clarify. Wants to, sure, of course. Someone who wants to ethnically cleanse a minority group who is advocating for you know, some sort of destruction of a people, who is threatening people's lives directly. Uh, so that's not your guy wearing a Make America Great Again hat. It's not the guy that says, you know, I think people of color deserve less or I think that they're lesser people. Uh, Those people have abhorrent ideas and we should combat them. But when you start saying we need to, you know, create a white nation, we need to create this. And the only way to do so is to rid this nation or the world of these people. That's when I'll 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 drop the the Nazi word on them. And uh, yeah, so that's you know, I think it's we're not using the word Nazi flippantly, which I think a lot of people think think is the case. And I think a lot of people do. A lot of people love to just say, you know, oh, Bill O'Reilly's a Nazi. Well, Bill O'Reilly's a jerk, but he's not trying to ethnically cleanse people. So I think, yes, if we're going to stick to a definition of what defines a Nazi in those terms, which I think many people have, if anyone deserves to get punched, it's going to be those people. If Richard Spencer declares us a nation founded by Europeans and that America in its purest form is a white nation... Does he deserve to be punched when he's giving that opinion on camera? Yeah, he does. Um, And it's not just because of that opinion per se. It's because of the cumulative work of Richard Spencer and the things he's put out there. What's the punch accomplished, Dan, once you deck him? And what are you going for? uh, We want the people that think like him and want to act like him to know that they're not going to be tolerated in public, that their ideas need to go back into the cave they came from. So you are prepared then to create a fear culture for the people whose ideas that you find abhorrent. Yeah, if, if, it, if it's protecting other people's lives that these people want to put at risk, I'm willing to, you know, as, as the saying goes, make racists afraid again. Well, you've just subjectively then decided what is a threat or what's not a threat. So what if someone defines it differently? Well, we have to look at that uh, empirically. We have to judge each decision in that way. And people can be wrong. A lot of people came to me and said, yeah, but there's Christians that hate your views on religion who are going to want to punch you. And I said, there most certainly are, and they could punch me. But I think we could make the argument that I'm just saying a belief is wrong, and they're saying a group of people don't deserve to exist. And I think if we compare those two, we can make a pretty subjective uh, opinion that one of those is actually harmful to lives and one is not. Dan, you've made a statement here as we've been talking already about the clumsy use of terms like Nazi, right? Overgeneralizations, people overusing the term. Mm -hmm. I've noticed on your Twitter feed, you talk a lot about liberals, classic liberals, and I find this a clumsy use of terms. What's a classic liberal? I mean, you're going after them and you say, quote, classic liberals pretend that Nazis don't exist. I mean, that is a hugely broad statement. Where does it come from? How do you define it? And how do you qualify it? So I'm letting I'm letting classic liberals define themselves. Uh, people like Dave Rubin, uh, 
Gadsad, etc. Wait, wait, they Dave are, Rubin? Wait, Dave Rubin is a classic liberal in your opinion? He he calls himself a classic liberal. He pushes classic. He, I mean, he openly says it. I I'm not putting words in his mouth. He says I'm a classic liberal. He fights for classic liberalism. That's his stance. That's if you, if you watch his show, he says it quite often that he wants to go back to a, a, a classical liberal view of things. And so I'm, I'm using their words. I'm not applying, you know, like a, a, a slur to them. These, these are the words they're using to define themselves. Does Jerry Coyne also qualify as a classic liberal in your opinion? Uh, I believe he's called himself one or at least alluded that he, he follows the classic liberal uh, way of thinking. They have both advocated for free speech, even the worst of speech. Do you find them to be Nazi sympathizers? Yeah. I don't oh. think – well, no. I don't think Jerry Coyne is someone – or even even Ruben that says like, oh, wow, Nazis are you know wonderful and they need our defense. I think what they're doing by pretending that all speech is equal or you know fighting for all speech being equal is that they're giving a platform in a sense that they don't need to be because we have a right to speech, but we don't have a right to a platform. So we don't have to defend Richard Spencer or somebody like him standing up and saying that we need to ethnically cleanse this world and say, well, we have to defend his right to a platform. No. What we need to defend is that the government can't come arrest him for that unless he says, now let's go do it now. Or let's do take you see, though, a distinction him. between a defense of Richard Spencer as a promoter of ideas and a defense of the structure of the Constitution in a free speech culture? Do you see a difference there? Well, no, because I, he's not having – there's no constitutional problem here with Richard Spencer. If, if someone comes and arrests him tomorrow for his ideas, then we have a first speech constitutional issue. And that's not what we're dealing with right now. What we're dealing with is that he can go and, and speak in different places, and what he's seeing is a reaction to that. So society's saying, we're not going to tolerate it. We're going to shut you down. But the government's not getting involved here. And – I think the government should stay out of it. I think unless he is purposefully saying, like, you know, let's get our guns now and go do it, then, of course, you have the government getting involved because that's illegal. All right, let me but, try to make sure I understand you, Dan. Not sure. to interrupt, but I want to make sure I'm oh, no, tracking please. with what you're trying to communicate. If he gives a specific call to action, violence against non-whites, whatever, the government, law and order, police, they get involved. If he is just saying it's a white nation, he feels it should be a white nation based on whatever philosophy or doctrine he's promoting at the time. He hasn't yet broken the law, so it's time for the people to step in, take matters into their own hands, and shut him down and make him afraid of promoting those ideas in public. You find that appropriate? I do find that appropriate. I think that uh, by by the, the people standing up and saying, we're not going to let this happen here, is an appropriate response to the speech he's giving. From a tweet from your account on the 3rd of May, a simple stroll down a classic liberal's timeline explains why they only speak up in defense of white supremacists. Can you defend that, Dan? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen uh, plenty of, of liberal uh, professors and what uh, come under fire. George Chicarello Marr, who is a professor at Drexel University, had been attacked for a tweet he sent out on Christmas, and then a recent tweet he sent out. So his Christmas tweet was, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. And then on even more recently, he tweeted that he almost threw up on an airplane when he saw someone give up uh, their first class seat to a soldier. And he came under investigation from both from his university and was attacked openly. And the uh, the free speech advocates have not come out in his defense. Uh, and we see this a lot. We see that in, Al in uh, Arizona, they tried to pass a law making teaching of social justice issues taken out of school. They wouldn't talk about social justice. And the same people that are defending the rights of Richard Spencer and Milo Yiannopoulos and uh, et cetera, Charles Murray are, are silent. They're not running out to the defense of this speech. You know, mine was an original observation but now multiple studies have started to pop up that are showing that uh, free speech advocates are driven more by prejudice than they are by principle. We addressed that study a little later on in the broadcast. I'm going to talk to Thomas Smith about it on serious inquiries. But it's a hugely broad statement. A classic liberal's timeline means what? Any and all? Anybody who 
falls under your subjective definition of classic liberalism. And just because you haven't seen an advocacy, you haven't seen a response doesn't mean the response doesn't exist. I've seen a ton of people on both sides of the Charles Murray issue or others. Some say that he deserved to speak. Others say that we should be speaking against him. Some say the university has a right to host him or the students do. And others say that that they should be condemned for doing so. But I'm seeing speech on both and all sides of the issues. So I'm not seeing anybody shut down or shut out. I'm not seeing cowardice. So I'm trying to figure out how, how do you source, how do you qualify this type of statement? I'm looking at the, the loudest proponents of the classic liberals, the classic liberal argument. So again, you're going back to you know the Dave Rubens and the uh, Jerry Coins and people like them that have the loudest voice in that in the classic liberal movement, and so, they're silent on that. So if I'm one of those people who thinks that Murray has a right to speak, a university student group has a right to invite Ann Coulter. If I'm one of those people who thinks Richard Spencer should not be punched, even if he's uttering the vilest of words, am I a Nazi sympathizer? No, you're not a Nazi sympathizer, but you're creating an environment that is allowing their ideals ideas to spread by not uh, looking at it. You're, you're, you're putting the rights of a platform over the rights of speech, in my opinion. So you understand, though, my resistance to a mob rule response to someone uttering vowels and consonants in front of a camera lens behind a microphone, we're still in the arena of ideas. I'm not saying ideas aren't powerful, but a physical response to somebody flapping their gums, somebody is uttering even the worst of words, and I just decide arbitrarily that they should be punched. And I draw that line differently than Bob, who drops it differently than Susan, than 360 million other citizens of the United States. You don't see that as a recipe for just chaos? I don't. I, I I think that we're looking. If we look at it at at, the, at a slippery slope, we're going to we're going to go about it the wrong way. Because what we're talking about is they're 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 not just vowels and syllables. They're they're violent words. They're it, saying that someone doesn't have a right to exist is a lot different than saying, oh, I think that you know trickle down economics is better than redistribution. Where you're you're literally saying that someone's right to exist is in question. And I don't think that's a debatable topic. It and is think, debatable. Why would it not be a debatable topic? Why would we mm-hmm. not be able to address the idea whether or not violence equals language or language equals violence? I, I disagree that words are the same as a baseball bat to the face, man. I mean, words can have power, but they're still words. We're still in the arena of ideas. Someone is offering an opinion, a perspective. Here's what I think. They don't have the right to say that, even if it's ugly speech. They've already lost that fight. The, we've 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 de- we debated over seventy years ago whether people uh, you know minority groups have a right to exist. So you're and judge and jury, Dan. I mean that's what I'm hearing. You're judge I and jury, and you just decided. Judge and jury. Society is judge and jury, and society has risen up against this kind of speech. A wildly the, the, diverse society, though, that is even now having a moment of real disagreement about where the line is drawn. There's no consensus here. I think there's an overwhelming consensus that Richard Spencer is wrong, and there's a there's a large group of people that are willing to make sure that his ideas do not spread and come to power again, because we know where his ideas lead. We know what he wants to accomplish, and the longer we stand back and say, let's let him spread his ideas and we'll just have better ones, the more chance he has to bring in more people and build his movement. And if we already know where that movement goes— we have an obligation to the people that he couldn't kill, hurt, or you know, cause serious problems for to defend them now. Richard Spencer then speaking an idea is the same as Richard Spencer pointing a rifle. I think so because that's what he—that's uh, the end goal of this idea he's pushing. He's building a movement to point the rifle, and we have an opportunity now to stop him from pointing that rifle. At the UC Berkeley protest, there was a section of rioters. Uh, most of the people, I believe, were there just holding signs and, and saying they disagreed. But there was a, a segment of the protest that became violent. At one point, they were throwing stones and accosting the police who were trying to restore law and order. Do you believe that all cops are terrorists? I believe that the police force is a an organization that is meant to oppress and to uh, silence anybody that is dissenting against the ruling class. April 29th of 2017, a tweet of yours at about seven in the evening. All cops are terrorists. Do you stand by that? I do. 
Almost a million law enforcement officers in the United States, they're all terrorists. They are all enrolled to uphold a, a systematic oppression of, of people by the ruling class. And I think if you ask me as a white person how I feel walking down the street at night and I see a cop, is going to be a much different opinion than if you ask a person of color how they feel when they walk down the street and see a cop. I, I can look over there and say, wow, I feel safe. And they think, wow, I might not be safe in this situation. Like that there's, there's a fear-based rule of power presented by law enforcement. And uh, I think that they're, they're terrorizing the American people in that way. April 30th on Twitter, you said, I don't want to reform the police. I want to abolish them. They only exist to uphold state violence and oppression. Yes? Yes. I think we have better, we have better ways of, of policing or not even, I don't want to use the word policing here, but of better ways of, of caring for our communities and the people in them. Give me an example. What's a better way? If you abolish the system of law and order that we have, what else do you do? You have a, a democratically run uh, community peacekeepers of people that live in that community, that understand the people in that community and that answer to the people in that community. So the civilians then become the police. The civilians then, you know, uh, that are picked, you know, democratically in their community that are trained in de-escalation, are trained in, you know, different peacekeeping methods, but then live in those communities that they serve, that they answer to their neighbors. And what we have now is we, you know, we have police officers that are assigned to different communities that aren't connected and they don't know what's happening in them. And these communities end up feeling terrorized by these people. And we have better methods of, of doing it. And, and one of those ways is to empower the people inside their own communities to make sure that they stay peaceful and safe and to be trained in uh, de-escalation. Dan Errol, I find it interesting to hear someone who is advocating violence against people who are spreading hate talking about the need for de-escalation. Well, that's, that comes from a, lot, a different place because we're talking about de-escalation in a community. That might just be a fight between two people. That might be someone who doesn't have something that wants to rob somebody. This isn't somebody that says, you know, I want to come ethnically cleanse this entire country. And if someone in that community does that, well, de-escalation might mean fighting back. That doesn't mean that we just throw out every instance of violence. There could be a person that comes into that community and says, you know, I want all people of color gone and I'm going to do that. And that community fights back to push that out. So in but, the Berkeley riot instance, then you mm -hmm. would consider the rioters to be on the side of good and the police to be on the side of, for lack of a better word, evil? Uh, yes, because, and it's not just because it was Milo speaking, it was because of what Milo was speaking about. The people that showed up to shut Milo down, and in their words, by any means necessary, was because they were trying to protect the students that Milo was attacking that night, that Milo wanted to, the immigrant students that Milo wanted to out and dox and then try to have deported and teach the people there how to accomplish that same goal. The rioters, the black bloc that showed up to stand against that made it clear they, they would have been just as happy to line up in front of the doors and have it shut down just by being there. But that didn't work, so they escalated their tactics, and it was a defensive tactic for those students that were under threat on that campus. So there's another guy standing right next to you and someone standing right next to them. You each have drawn the line in a different place as to what is or is not acceptable or threatening speech. How do the three of you work it out where the line is drawn? When violence begins, what's appropriate? How do you hash it out in a democratic society? You're gonna have to you're gonna have to talk it out in that sense. I mean, if if you're in a protest, you're going to act uh, in accordance to your belief. So if if violence breaks out and you're saying next to a uh, a vowed pacifist that's not going to get involved and he walks away, he walks away. Yeah, but who's on the uh, right? If you all three are looking at Richard Spencer, and let's say only one of you thinks it's violent speech using your terminology, and the other two say, ah, he's not there yet. Do you not see this as you know, a minefield where you're using these subjective perceptions, often based in emotion, I would assume, as to when violence should begin as a response? Well, I don't think it's an emotion when I, when I hear that someone doesn't have a right to exist that you don't have an emotional not, response to not, that that's well that's a i mean it is an emotional response but it's i'm not driven by emotion there i'm driven by these people have a right to exist you're punching and them you in the say, name of reason is what you're telling me uh, yes 
uh, that's a, I think that's a great way to put it. You realize because- how that sounds, Dan? It just makes you sound like a total reactionary. You know, it sounds like emotion is leading the train and you're justifying it by saying that you are being reasonable. You know, hey, they made me do it is what I'm hearing you say. And I'm, I'm having a hard time jiving it. It's not reactionary. Uh, it's defensive. And it might not be defensive for me because let's say Richard Spencer exploded tomorrow and got all the followers he needed and wanted to storm the streets. I'm pretty sure I can pass off as being safe because I'm a straight white male who has a, you know, a all American looking family. I'm fine. But friends of mine and people I don't know won't be. So I'm willing to fight for them. So it's not reactionary to think that when somebody says you don't have a right to exist and we're willing to use violent methods to make sure you don't, which Richard Spencer has, that's not a reactionary. That's a defensive maneuver. If there are people then, though, who are they're non-white, they're women, they are LGBTQ, they are in the persecuted minority who are what you would call FSWs, free speech warriors, who do say that Richard Spencer has a right to speak, even the ugliest of language. You're acting on their behalf, but against their wishes. There are a lot of people who fit that definition. How would you respond to that? I would also respond that there's a lot of people that fit the opposite, and we have to make our decisions based on what we think is best. The kind of a superhero, and, you know, you're standing well, up for the little guy. Is that what I'm hearing? Because no, because it, it sounds like you've assumed a position of responsibility for a, a series of demographics who never appointed you to the position. Well, there those those people are fighting alongside us, though, and it's not. You know what? When I saw Richard Spencer get punched the first time, I thought to myself immediately that I thought no one deserved it better. But when the argument decided to kind of grow into, you know. Ought we be punching Nazis? Should you know? Is this moral? Is this just? I didn't just say, "Well, yeah," because that's what I think. I went to people who would be affected. I went to people like Sincere Carabo of the American Humanist Association. I went to James Croft, uh, you know, in, in St. Louis, who is a uh, LGBTQ advocate and uh, humanist chaplain, and had conversations with people like that and said, "You know, what do you think? How do you feel?" Because you're, you would be the victim of this. And I've talked to plenty that said, nope, I, I think that they have a right to speech. And I listened to the people that said, nope, we need to fight back. And given all of that, I had to make the best judgment call I could based on what I heard. So Richard Spencer is hanging out with his buddies and he reads your blog and he says, Dan Errol thinks all cops are terrorists. Dan Errol thinks that violence should be used against what we're saying from behind the podium. Dan Errol is using violent speech. He is encouraging and instigating and inciting violence. We should preempt with violence of our own. What happens if you're speaking to me, somebody punches you first because you're using violent speech? Is that justified? It's not justified, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. Because there, it, when we're looking at justification, we have to look at all evidence available. And I'm not looking at violence in the sense of we're pushing it first. They've already laid out their violent ideology. Their ideology is rooted in violence. My ideology is rooted in defense. So they've already said our goal is X, which in X is to eradicate and create a white nation. My then pushback in defense is against that. It's not as though they just came out and said, we're white nationalists, and then I went and attacked. They already laid out their plan. So we're being, you know, and I'm being defensive on that front. So if they want to come and attack me, well, they can because, well, because they can. But we can look at why they're doing so in comparison and make that judgment call on are they being right or wrong. And I think we can say that they're preemptively attacking me for defending against their ideology. You've been pretty hard on several people in the atheist movement, for lack of a better word who have disagreed with you publicly on this issue, it's gotten pretty nasty. You want to address any of that? What are your thoughts? I think that this is probably, for I think for, for years and years, we sort of all just got on with the fact that we don't have everything in common, but we have one driving factor in common, which was our non-belief in God. And we use that uh, as community building. 
And I think that was wonderful. But I think what we're seeing now is that as atheism is becoming more and more normalized, we're seeing that it's 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 spreading to other demographics. I mean, even Richard Spencer has said he doesn't believe in God. So we now have this much more diverse map of atheists. And now the lines are starting to be drawn as to uh, grouping almost. And I think that's just naturally human to sort of gravitate towards towards groups. But I'm not, I'm not and, talking about Richard Spin. I mean, I'm talking well, about, no, I'm not talking about I'm Jerry that, Coyne. I'm talking about Stephen Knight. Uh, right. Didn't you have and, a but, row with Matt Dillahunty? I mean, uh, you know, we, these are people who are, they are well-respected voices in the movement and have been with us, not just for, you know, months, for a series of years and even decades. Right. And what we found is that our one uniting force, which is atheism, isn't enough to hold us together. We have drastically different political views and worldviews on how the world uh, ought to be. And we can't just assume that because we don't believe in God, that we can just get along perfectly. And well, what I I'm think- seeing, though, in the Twitter feed is not just, hey, we disagree passionately on this issue. Back and forth, I see a series of just nasty language, fuck yous and insults and IQ ratings of, you know, single digits and people are throwing, you know, mud over the fence back and forth. Do you find this counterproductive when we're trying to fight the bigger war against superstition out there? Yeah, I do think it's probably counterproductive, but I think it's not going to last. Well, what are you I doing think- it for is my question. I mean, why engage? Well- I'm, I'm literally trying to unengage as much as I can with that, but it's, it becomes, you, you get caught up in it. You get the, you know, you say something and then someone comes back and you go back and forth and then you say, crap, why did I go back and forth? They why made you I do engage? it. It's what I'm I hearing. Should've, well, no, I, no, I participated just as much as anybody else. So I'm just as guilty as participating. I could have from the get go said, I'm not engaging, but we both or all, I mean, all parties involved, you know, I'll say both is as in one or the other back and forth engaged in it. And we were probably both wrong for doing so. But I think right now what we're seeing is the, the movement, uh, you know, like you said, for lack of a better word is, is figuring out its place. Now we're, we're, we're growing drastically and we're going to realize that we're just not all going to get along and that we're going to need to either, you know, align on the places we agree or, just not work together and that we can both think that separate church state is the most important but we can fight it on our own uh in our own places we don't have to come together because you're not going to like everybody you're not going to get along with everybody and i think what we're seeing now for the first time in a big way is that the movement is is, is splintering and dividing into just different groups and I think that's normal i think it's natural and i think eventually it is the the infighting will probably just dwindle away, become less, and we'll all just go about doing what we were doing before. I'm in an odd position, Dan. You know, you've been on the show with me over the course of a couple of years, I think two, three years. We, You came out and opened for me in San Diego. We're friends. We stand apart on this issue, you and I, and I honestly think that you and your platforms excuse and or promote violence. And it's difficult for me. You know, it was, it was a hard decision as to whether or not to even do the show. But I think, well, let's allow the opinions to have the light of day. You know, let's, if I'm always talking about speech, let's have the speech and let's bring Dan on and let's have a, an adult conversation about these. But I, I, what I'm hearing from my perspective is just rationalizations for punching the people who we decide arbitrarily are the purveyors of hate. And it's actually a self-refuting argument, because what we're saying is that the words and ideas of the Nazi is so powerful as to deserve a violent reprisal, a physical punch. But the words and ideas of better people who are promoting better ideas, well, that's a weak and impotent response. We're affording to the Nazi so much more power when it comes to ideas than we are ourselves. And I'm worried that you're opening the floodgates for just a host of biased, subjective crusaders who are going to go out and decide beyond the rule of law when they're going to take matters into their own hands with a fist or a bat or a crowbar or a stone or a torch or whatever they decide to use. And I'm worried that you are fueling a discussion that ought to be approached with reason, but you're doing so with a more visceral, emotional approach. I don't have a problem feeling the things that we think about. We're human beings with multiple dimensions. But we start kicking and punching in the presence of somebody's language. It just seems like it's a huge recipe for trouble. And, you know, I look at people who pop up in the conversations that are happening on Twitter. Jerry Coyne, he's a good man. 
who's done amazing work, Matt Dillahunty, Stephen Knight. These are good people, reasonable people who deserve so much more than the labels or being aligned with Nazi sympathizers or white nationalists or classic liberals. I'm in this odd place, Dan, where I, I see your position as potentially destructive and possibly provoking other people to carry out violence, unnecessary, illegal, immoral violence against other people in the name of laudable ideas. You want to respond to any of that? Do you have any thoughts on any of that? I think the the, the truth is, though, that we already have that. We already have people that go and kill abortion doctors because they think that they're doing wrong. We already have people that uh, you know, will kill a non-believer because they're threatened by their non-belief. These already exist. It's not like this is something brand new that's being brought upon because uh, the, the these new rise of Nazism or or far right nationalism is rising now. That this is going to open the floodgates for something that isn't already happening out there. What we're seeing is, and, and one point you kind of made was, you know, we're making these arbitrary calls on what's right or wrong but we isn't that how every single decision has to be made on what's right or wrong when we invaded germany we had to make uh, as a, as you know our government and as a nation had to make that call on whether what they were doing was right or wrong when we invade any country when anybody invades anybody or anybody attacks another force for doing what they consider wrong we're making a, a moral judgment call based on the facts we have and we know for a fact that nations have made immoral decisions or thought they were making fact-based decisions and were wrong. So we, we already see this is, this is already part of everyday life. What we're doing now is saying we already understand Richard Spencer and, and his and, – and not just Richard Spencer, but just that his movement in general. His, their goals have already been laid forward. We know what they want to accomplish, and we know how they can accomplish it because we've actually seen it before. We can look back and learn from the past and watch how their actions are coming about and think, wow, we have a chance to stop this now. And when it comes to the battle of ideas, those ideas have already been beaten, but they they are persisting. So I don't think that this market of ideas and that just having better ideas can beat it because – We've already we've already tried that. It didn't work. I don't and see the Nazi think, army storming over the hill, man. You well, know, I don't not, see a physical threat coming after me at this do moment. Do we want to wait for that moment to come? Do I is have that, a choice? If I'm going to live in a civilized society, am I going to assume that someone will translate a bad idea into lethal or harmful action? And once we start down that road, are all bets off? And it's mass chaos. I assumed, I perceived, I got a hunch that he was about to do this to me. So I kicked him, punched him, shot him, harmed him, maimed him, killed him. You don't see this as a recipe for disaster. I don't because I I think that already exists. And I don't think that's escalating. I think what we're dealing with now is that we have people that are actually saying these are our goals that we want to accomplish. We're not guessing that Richard Spencer wants to eradicate people of color. We know he wants to. We're not, we don't have a hunch. He's published the works. He said but what the he words. wants and what he intends to do, saying, I hate you, is different than saying, I'm going to kill you. And if one but he's equals- not he's not saying that's what he thinks. He's saying that's what he wants and what he's fighting towards. That's the movement he's building. He's not just some guy in a garage saying, I feel this way. He's building a movement of people. He's recruiting people to bring about that goal. He's not just saying like, you know, he's not some guy sitting on his couch saying, well, I hate black people. That person has problems, but they're not harming. Spencer is building a a, a movement and it's growing and they're training how to fight. I mean, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center just published a piece about, you know, they're literally running trainings on how to fight and how to combat other people to push their idea further. So what we have is people literally building a movement to cause a threat. So he's not just spreading an idea. He's building that movement with this idea. He's taking this idea on the road to recruit and to build because he knows he needs numbers. So bomb what? Bomb the militias kind of thing? I mean, you know, go to their camps and find the barbed wire and just knock them out kind of deal? Or I don't – well, you know what? If If they're building camps and arming themselves, well, then 
maybe that's where we have to go. Well, right well, shit, now, that shit's been going on for forever. I mean, you've had these people warning about the overreach of government or whatever pet cause they happen to to grab, and they've got their little pod somewhere, and they talk about the end of days and, and how right, they're a big they're, part they're, of it. But those people, you know, like that, you know, that libertarian live in the woods argument. They're in a defensive mode. They're not in, in an attack mode. Uh-huh. They're they're scared and they're in the woods ready to defend themselves because they're thinking of, you know, my personal liberty. All right. They're so they're stockpiling of weapons and warnings about the government overreach and all and of they're, that. They're That's... waiting for the government to come take them. They're waiting for that, you know, moment where the government comes and and takes over their lives. Tell and that to Timothy there's... McVeigh. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it just doesn't. I, I just think. We are speaking about hugely broad and complex and nuanced issues involving often thousands or even millions of people, and we're speaking about them in single terms and bumper stickers, and it just becomes so problematic. And all of this filtered through each person's subjective perception. You know, you mentioned the abortion doctors earlier and the fact that there were some who believed that it's okay to kill an abortion doctor because you're saving all these number of lives. And you could paint all of Christianity with that brush. But the truth is, I come from the cradle of Christianity. I don't know anybody who would advocate the killing of an abortion doctor. And so we have to treat each of these people with fairness and we have to understand what their perceptions really are. You know, there were some who believed that blasphemy should be punished by death. We've seen recent people, we got a governor of Jakarta going to prison for two years because he broke a blasphemy law. Stephen Fry recently in the crosshairs in Ireland. You'll find other people who think that blasphemy should be treated another way or another way or another way. We can't treat all these with a, just this singularly broad brush. And I think that's my point. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point when we're talking about groups that have liberal, moderate to extreme sex. We know that there is an extreme, deadly version of Islam, and we also know that there is incredibly liberal and left Muslims. We know that there's extreme, murderous Christians, but we also know that there's left Christians who couldn't be further from that. But when we're talking about, you know, and we're going to get into the fine detail here of, of, of Nazism, of Nazis, there's not a liberal to extreme version of Nazism. They've laid out, this is our plan, this is our goal. So we're, we have to remember that we're not dealing with you know, one extreme to the other. We're dealing with a, a literal, just straight extremist group. It's like dealing with ISIS direct. You're not looking at ISIS as, well, there's some liberal ISIS members and there's some not. No, ISIS as an organization is an imminent threat. And people like Richard Spencer and this movement he's building are trying to create that imminent threat. Yeah, but ISIS is that. beheading people on video. ISIS is is raping and pillaging and killing. ISIS is carrying out specific acts of violence. Richard Spencer is just saying what he thinks. But he wants to get there. That's the that's the problem. If and I think this way, if I was in the Middle East somewhere before ISIS was rising and they were organizing, and I had a chance to fight back and stop them if and through you know through the means of violence or punching the leader that was trying to uh, start the movement, would I? And I would say yes. If I, you, but what does pun, punching him accomplish, Dan? I mean, you're going to get a violent reaction and you're going to make a martyr out of the person that you just decked. They're going to say, we're under attack. They struck first. You've just played into their hands and empowered their narrative. But they're going to, they're going to play the martyr and play the victim regardless of what we do. If their speech gets shut down, they play the victim. If they don't get what they want, they play the victim. So, but... If, if we can stop their rise, so I, I, I don't see a scenario where you could have stopped ISIS using violence and didn't and then said, oh, but then now they've, you know, they've grown and become a deadly force. It's you by any means necessary to stop a, a movement that wants to eradicate human beings off this planet. We have to stop that. We have to stand up against it. Dan Errol, I appreciate you appearing on the show and speaking your mind and any other final thoughts before we call it a day? No, I just want to uh, say thank you for having me on. And I think uh, I'm looking forward to listening to this and hearing all the perspectives of people. Oh, you're going to get perspective, Dan. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, you and I couldn't stand more apart. And honestly, I, I, I mean, I really do. I, I just have to say out loud, I find your approach to this a little bit terrifying. I find it uh, in many ways part of the problem. And it's, 
it's difficult. But at the same time, you know, you and I've managed to have a 30 minute whatever conversation here. We've been able to have it amicably. We disagree probably vehemently <laughs> on this specific <laughs> issue. But we've, you know, at the end of the day, our, no one's shouting, no one's throwing bottles at each other. And I think that's the point. So I appreciate you offering your perspective on the show. And, and it's greatly appreciated, sir. Well, thank you very much. You know, looking back on the conversation that you just heard with Dan Errol, one question or point I wish I'd raised during the exchange was that Richard Spencer does not call himself a Nazi. He doesn't embrace that term for himself. Now, whether he's being cagey or coy, who really knows? Other people, though, are the ones who have called him a Nazi. So when they say you're going after Nazism... They are the ones who are declaring that Richard Spencer is a Nazi, and then they're using that measuring stick to carry out violence or excuse violence against him. And I found that was an interesting thing. When someone looks at someone else and says, you're a Nazi, but the person being branded or labeled does not embrace or accept that term in relation to themselves, does that become even more problematic? I'm not excusing Richard Spencer. I'm just saying the guy doesn't call himself a Nazi. I don't know. It's just another layer to the onion, right? Let's go back to the switchboard and see what our listeners have to say. I've got Craig on Skype. Craig, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's going on? Hey, nice to talk to you, Seth. We're talking about free speech. We're talking about, well, not just Nazis. We're talking about people who are the promoters of some of the worst ideas and attitudes out there in a free speech culture. Is it ever appropriate to just haul off and use physical force against him? You have a perspective on this, Craig? Yeah, I don't even know how that's a question. Just because somebody has a stupid idea or a wrong opinion is no excuse to initiate force against someone. Now, I'm a big believer in self-defense. Uh, I'm what you would call a sheepdog. I could explain that if you want. Go ahead. There's a metaphor in which it's okay to be sheep. I'm not talking about... Uh, the blood of the lamb or any any of that kind of sheep. But a sheep in this idea is someone who just wants to live their life and they don't want to do violence against anybody. There are wolves who are people who are willing to do violence against the sheep to get what they want. And there are sheepdogs who are people who are willing to do violence against the wolves in order to protect the sheep or themselves. So you're a sheepdog. Yeah, which... And you'll find lots of sheepdogs among, you know, military and law enforcement and, you know, firefighters. And it's not all that uncommon. But the idea is I'm not I'm not just blanket against violence. I'm not a pacifist. But the only speech that needs protecting is offensive speech. If someone goes out and they say that I believe that all black people are inferior. You know, white supremacist is saying something like, I wish they were eradicated from the earth. Does that constitute a threat against people who are non-whites? And does a violent response then come into play? You know, is that a threat that we should address? I think a threat is an actual threat. People spouting off nonsense like that. The protection they need is the protection to be able to spout off nonsense like that to not get punched in the face for saying something stupid and offensive. Now, obviously, there are, you know, the limits, like if someone is in the middle of a bar fight and screaming, you know, hit him again, that may or may not be the kind of speech we need to protect. But spouting off a stupid, you know, religious or racist or, or whatever opinion is not grounds for getting punched in the face. There's a difference between saying, I wish they were dead and... I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah. And obviously right now there are people who are hammering at their keyboards going, what kind of apologist are you for these purveyors of hateful ideas? And I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I'm not an apologist for them. This is not about them. It's a cliche, but there's merit to the, the Voltaire quote. What is it? I'll defend to the death your right to say it. There's an interesting angle, I think, was it Christopher Hitchens, and I'm going to play a clip from him later in the broadcast, but there are many people who said that when you go and you decide arbitrarily that you're going to physically take somebody out and make them afraid to open their mouth, you are making a decision for anybody else who might be within earshot that they shouldn't hear the words that are coming out of this person's mouth. Essentially, someone's deciding for me. I yeah. shouldn't hear it, and I don't want to surrender that to anybody else. Quite frankly, I want to know what they're saying, 
and then I can choose whether to agree or disagree, to laud or condemn. But that's my choice to make. Exactly. Well, it's the saying, sunshine is the best disinfectant. All right, Craig, thanks so much for sounding off and adding your speech to the broadcast. Greatly appreciated, man. You bet. I hope I wasn't too offensive. (laughs) That's funny. I had an email in from CJ. CJ said, one of the problems with believing that everyone deserves equal rights is that jerks are included. I may not like it, but people are allowed to be terrible in a free country. If someone is not directing their comments at a single individual or threatening bodily harm, then the only way to beat their bad ideas is with better, more enlightened ones. When we take a swing, we stoop to their level, and while punching a Nazi could be incredibly cathartic, the action does nothing to progress the world forward in a way so many of us are hoping to. I was raised Southern Baptist. I was once the kid in high school that had a t-shirt with George W. Bush's post-9-11 speech, the one where he says, we will flush them out, on the front and back, complete with a big old American flag, a gun, and a bald eagle. Not kidding. I was once closer in my thinking to the Nazi than a free thinker. I was once the white kid in school that was a little nervous around students of a different color, all four of them. I was won over and my mind was changed with better ideas and interactions with wonderful people who were accepting and loving. Had I been punched in the face, who knows where I'd be today? I would have probably felt validated in my thinking. Validating bad ideas is the exact opposite of what I feel this movement represents. I want to be the ones that have the facts and the compassion to win over minds with intellect. I don't want to be the one standing on a corner just waiting to punch something different. I was part of that thinking before. I'm different now for a reason. CJ, thanks very much for the message. There's an interesting documentary. I don't know if it's still on Netflix. You should check it out. Anybody should check it out. It's called Erasing Hate. It's about a white supremacist, a guy with just some horrible ideas, racist ideas. And he had these Nazi tattoos, white supremacist tattoos all over his body, including all over his face. And he had in his life a change of heart. He realized he was wrong in his hate, but he was stuck with all these tattoos all over his body, all over his face. I mean, you couldn't hide them. And so over the course of years, and they documented on video the pain that he went through, Over the course of years, he went through the process of having these tattoos lasered off. Is that what you call it? And it's brutal. His face is completely swollen. He can barely speak. His eyes are swollen shut. The recovery for each procedure takes months. And yet he continues to go back in time and time and time again until piece by piece, this sort of record of his racist ideas This billboard for white supremacy that was the skin covering his body was transformed. And those messages were literally erased. It's really, it's a hard show to watch, but it's also in many ways interesting and very inspiring. It's called Erasing Hate. So look for it on Netflix. I've got Megan on Skype. Megan, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. How's it going? Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Have you ever seen or run into someone who was saying something truly awful and you just wanted to haul off and punch him? Ever felt like that? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think <laughs> I guess if we're being honest with think, ourselves, yeah. we all sometimes <laughs> feel like it sure would feel good, right? It sure would feel good it just would to be. go for oh, it. Oh yeah. What's your perspective on that kind of a reaction to what is termed hate speech out there? Is it appropriate to punch these people? I don't think it's okay to punch people just because they hold uh, bad ideas or or hold bad beliefs. It's just one of those things that if you think that it's okay to punch people for having a bad idea or 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 being, you know, let's let's call it what it is, you know, racist or um, homophobic or transphobic or any of these things. 
these are things that I, you know, I'm an advocate of. I'm, I'm trying to help people that are being marginalized, and I don't want that to, to be something that they have to fear from these people. So I mean, I'm a strong proponent of that. But I just think that if you, if you're assaulting someone, that's not really going to get your ideas across. It's not going to change their mind. And all right, so you don't subscribe to the idea of a violent form of speech. Speech that is violent, speech that requires self defense. I think if you're being physically harmed, I think I, well, I think most people think this. If if you're being physically attacked, then you have the right to defend yourself. But I don't think that it, it extends to if someone's saying nasty things that it's okay to physically punch them. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know because I you know I was a devout Christian, atheists were the worst thing you could be, and um, you know that was definitely taught to me. <laughs> As a Christian, you know, there's nothing worse than being an, an atheist, and they're trying to take your children away from you and, and send your, your loved ones to eternal torment by taking you away from Christ. And what could be more violent in speech than trying to do that? So, you know, why wouldn't they have any justification to punch atheists and stop them from speaking up, which they have done, you know, over the course of centuries, they've, you know, tried to eradicate any disbelief, <laughs> which didn't quite so- work. Now, not to interrupt, but I want to make sure that I'm I'm tracking with you here. So you saw mm-hmm. the atheist in a way as being a promoter of hateful speech. They hate God. They hate morality and your value system. Were you afraid of the atheist in that way? Or oh yeah, yeah no, definitely as a Christian, okay. that was um, you know, you really weren't supposed to associate with any atheist whatsoever because you know that will no, and the speech was it was going against everything that you've held sacred. It was an affront. It was offensive to Jesus, to God. You know, you couldn't speak that way. And and if anybody did, you know, that was truly, you know, it was a battlefield. It was a battlefield for um, Christ. These were souls, you know, what what could be more important than your eternal life? And, um, you know. <laughs> oh, Megan, Megan, how far you have fallen. Oh, I know. you I are know. now an atheist. Uh, you are now looking at this through the looking glass on the other side. And uh, that's probably a whole show right there. We could probably do a whole podcast about that. Yeah. Yeah. Megan, thanks for calling the uh, broadcast. Thanks for your perspective. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. I have on Skype Thomas from the Serious Inquiries Only broadcast. Thomas, thanks for being here, man. Hey, thank you for having me. We had spoken on an interview that I'd done on your show recently, and uh, you'd mentioned that you'd had some of these conversations in your own circle and might have a perspective and some info about it. So sound off. What do you think about all this, man? Well, absolutely. And uh, I go into it more depth in my show. But I, yeah, my biggest thing is I really like coming at things skeptically and having the facts on my side. And unfortunately, when you talk about, say, the Ann Coulter incident, there is so much misinformation out there. And people, I think, are really throwing Berkeley under the bus. Last bastion of free speech, or it used to be so key in the free speech movement, now they've lost their way. Have you heard that kind of thing? What specifically are people getting wrong about the Ann Coulter story? Well, she was not disinvited. Berkeley, uh, to their credit, after the Milo riots destroyed half a million in property, they took security measures and they worked with the police to come up with a set of protocols for anyone who was going to inspire that kind of a response again. And so they were working with these Republican groups to get her a spot, to find her a venue. They offered several different times and places, like, here's where we can do it. We can cover the security for you guys. You won't have to pay anything. We will take care of all of it. All you have to do is follow these reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, which are totally kosher with the First Amendment. And uh, they refused. So when they refused, she decided she was going to come on a day and time of her choosing and the <laughs> that was an idea so bad that even the Republican groups who had invited Milo Yiannopoulos in December were like, all right, that's too stupid for even us. Well, as I was opening the show, I think I framed it as it was canceled due to security concerns. There was a fear that there might be other violent reprisals, more riots. There might be a, a concern about her safety or the safety of others. And so law enforcement and whatnot, it was not for her. For Milo, they did for her. The uh, the first one was canceled when they wouldn't agree to do it on the Berkeley PD's time and place restrictions. So that's when the first time the school said, we're canceling this because you won't follow our protocols. Then there was so much pressure on the school, they backed off and they said, all right, we found a different venue. It's a mile away. 
it's securable for this many people. You can do it. And they didn't like it. So they wouldn't follow Berkeley's uh, rules. And because of which, if had they done so, the talk would have happened. And so I, I think that Berkeley's really getting a bad rap in this when if you look at the chancellor's statements, you look at the communication director's statements, like they wanted to make this work. They did what they could within their power and within proper security measures to make it work. And I think Ann Coulter wanted to play the victim and wanted to have a chance to, to paint herself as a martyr for free speech. And I frankly, I, I think that's a load of crap. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's unfortunate how much they're getting smeared in the media, in my, in my opinion. Any other thoughts about all this? Absolutely. So there's a study and, and, you know, I love bringing science into the question whenever I can. Uh, there's a recent study that just came out from the University of Kansas and it showed and this was just this month. It showed that there's a strong correlation and uh, hold on, stay with me, everybody, because <laughs> I, I, I sense people are going to uh, uh, um, yeah, the causation you know, correlation and, yeah. thing and they're going to come after yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a strong correlation between using the free speech defense and racism. And now I, I don't want to say, I because I defend free speech as well, I'm not saying anyone who defends free speech is racist, not at all. But the fact is, this experiment that they did, they took some individuals, they, they showed them racist speech, and if these people were racists that, that they were asking, they tended to defend that speech using free speech terms. And now you might say, okay, maybe they're just really pro-free speech. Not the case. When they showed them those same people speech that was critical of the police, or critical of like other leadership, maybe the president or something like that, these people, all of a sudden, free speech rights were not important to them. <laughs> and they and they uh, they flipped it. And so I, I don't mean to say that this is what's going on with everybody, by no means, but I think it's a lot of what's going on with this. And the best example is Milo Yiannopoulos himself. Because, Seth, what brought down Milo? What, what got his book deal canceled? And what got him fired from Breitbart? Breitbart. How do you get fired from Breitbart? They're like, we have standards. We, we have standards here, at Breitbart. You're too far. What got him fired? It was his own words. Words got him fired. All of a sudden, and all those free speech arguments still applied. All the people who are like, well, I don't agree with everything Milo says, but, you know, I defend his right. He should be out there. I defend his right. That all still applied when he said words about, you know, having a relationship with men when he was underage. But he finally went to a place in speech where his supporters didn't agree. And so all of a sudden, all those arguments died down and he lost his job. He lost his book deal. He lost everything. Because in my opinion, that's a lot of what was happening. Again, not all of it. Maybe you're a free speech fundamentalist. You defend everybody. That's great. But a lot of what was out there was because really they agreed with his transphobia. They agreed with his wanting to deport everybody, all, all the things he was saying, and they wanted his speech out there. And the minute he went somewhere where they couldn't follow, he was out. Do you believe that someone heckling somebody else down is itself an act of free speech? No, I believe that you have the right. So that's, this is where I try to find a nuanced position in this. And that's what I love about you and your show, too, uh, because this is a really key area where you can't just go black or white. You got to go, you know, gray. I think that Milo and Ann Coulter should be allowed to speak. Uh, Milo, it's questionable because, you know, he attacked a trans student. I'm not sure if you've covered that, but he literally went to a school, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and put up a slide of a trans student and started verbally abusing the student in front of fellow students. And that, to me, that's when you lose your, your right to speak at a college, when you've attacked a student specifically. But if we're talking about Ann Coulter, I disagree with the people who prevented her, who would intend to prevent her from speaking. Like if they plan on shutting down the talk, I disagree with it. Like the Charles Murray one, I think is an even uh, worse example. I disagree with Charles Murray, I, of course, like I, I really don't, that's a whole different discussion, but it doesn't matter I, what they did, what the students did in that case was horrible and I don't support it, but we have to keep it in perspective because oftentimes in a lot of these things, there's a large number of people of students peacefully protesting, like in Berkeley with the Milo riots, there was 1500 students who were peacefully protesting, who were holding up signs, just wanted to exercise their first amendment rights. And then there's about a hundred people who came there to be anarchists and to do violence. And that's what we can't support, of course. But don't paint all university students as special snowflakes because of 100 people in black block clothing who were ruining it for everybody, essentially. It's painted in some ways as an act of valor to go out and shout down the worst, to make them afraid of 
even showing their faces in public, of having their voices heard in public. Let's just, let's put the fear in them. Yeah, that's the only problem with that is you like that while it happens to be going your way. The minute the white nationalists come and are in greater numbers and are stopping, I don't know, LGBT rights activists, civil rights activists, the minute they're stopping one of your guys, you're like, wait, hold on, never mind. I don't like this system. <laughs> I don't like this game. Let me change the rules. And that that won't work. I mean, it's just not sustainable. The The best way to move forward and to make sure that we all can get hurt and have a chance to change minds is to ensure the peaceful protest and free speech, in my opinion. I, I think shouting down, I mean, whatever's within the law. In my, I think our First Amendment is incredibly robust in this country. It's something we've talked about on opening arguments a ton. And it's something that's worth protecting because it gives us all that chance to change minds without resorting to violence. Let me address one last thing and I'll have you sound off and tell me your perspective. There seems, in my opinion, to be a contradiction as to the power of language. The people who look at a Milo Yiannopoulos or a Richard Spencer or whoever are saying that the words that they are saying behind the microphone or on the television camera, they're so strong that they constitute a kind of violence that require a violent response. At the same time, they're saying the words of those who are countering hate are weak and pathetic. And I find that a huge contradiction. I can't reconcile the two. Do you have a perspective on that? I think that's a great point. And I think that is a, is a contradiction. I, I think it goes the other way almost. I think the violence that you perpetuate in service of, of your cause is more powerful in that it's more likely to motivate the other side. Let me give you a quick example. I live in Sacramento, California, the capital. And the, a few years ago, I think it was, there was a planned protest by like nine white supremacists. Now, of course, these people are horrible. Of course, I hate what they're saying. But they were going to go with their stupid little signs and their white power, whatever. They reserved their time legally to protest at the Capitol. No one would have cared about this. I, I mean, I, again, it's offensive. I get it. I, like, I, I don't agree with them. No one would have cared. But a group of Antifa, you know, people who come in their black block where their sticks and knives planned an attack on these people and they attacked them and it became a gigantic fiasco. It brought more attention to their racist message than they possibly could have. It exploded them in the media. It was a big stir and a lot of them were hurt. I mean, they, uh, someone got stabbed, people got beaten, bloodied. If you want to motivate the other side, all you have to do is bloody them up and let them be martyrs for their cause. That's going to motivate them more than anything. So I think you're making a great point, and I think that's a contradiction. I think that our words are going to be more powerful if for no other reason than our violence is absolutely going to be powerful in motivating the other side, in backfiring on what we're trying to do. When I was talking to Nathan Phelps, the son of Fred Phelps, the founder of Westboro mm -hmm. Baptist Church, he was talking about how Westboro would go out to public events with their horribly offensive picket signs, and they were hoping for a violent reprisal because it gave them a chance to play yeah. victim. And then they go to court, right? Now they're a, a plaintiff in a lawsuit. Exactly. I think that's precisely uh, it, a little bit different, but but along the lines of what Ann Coulter is doing. Thomas Smith from the Serious Inquiries Only. I always say inquiries. Is it inquiries or inquiries? <laughs> it depends on if you're British or <laughs> like <laughs> because the, inquiry is I, always hard for me to say. It's one of those yeah, weird yeah, words. Yeah. It just rolls off the tongue. But uh, right, right. Uh, you know, it was a real pleasure to be a, a part of your broadcast. I'm so glad you were sort of sounding off here. We're going to continue the conversation on the radio, and of course, I would encourage anybody to check out your show because you guys cover a lot of a lot of legal type issues relating to the culture, relating to the current Absolutely. administration, that kind of stuff. Is that right? Yeah. I I mean, opening arguments. Uh, so the two podcasts, opening arguments is the one with Andrew, the lawyer. And every day, everything that happens with Trump, people are asking us, can he do this? Uh, is he going to be, uh, you know, impeached? And uh, Andrew covers all those legal tidbits. So it's, it. it's good stuff. That's a whole podcast title. Will Donald yeah. Trump be impeached is tonight yeah. at eight, you know, on <laughs> podcast one yeah. or whatever. We have a segment where we start, we play the uh, yodeler from Price is Right. And it's like <laughs> Donald Trump is yodeling toward being <laughs> impeached. So that's how we introduce the segment every time. It's funny. Thomas Smith, thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast and for your perspective. Greatly appreciated. I can't thank you enough for having me. Thanks, Seth. And thanks for what you do. Don't forget, my patrons get a 100% commercial-free version of the broadcast. 
and a bonus show every single month. And thank you so much for your support on Patreon. You can just log on to patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. It's hard to know how to close a show like this, but I want to spend these last 15, 20 minutes, if I may, kind of putting a punctuation mark from the perspective of your host, which is one of the privileges of hosting a show is you get a chance to sort of editorialize a little bit. Yesterday, on part one of the show, there was a gentleman named George, and he had commented that he would make an exception to the whole we can all get along idea, and he would punch a Nazi rather than risk the idea that society had accepted the Nazi position. Now, I think I'm representing George's comment correctly here, but it's my opinion that within this statement lies clear evidence of one of the problems. Because did anybody say or even imply that if they decide not to carry out physical violence, they decide not to punch the antagonist in the face, that they are automatically taking a position of acceptance? If I don't resort to physical violence, if I don't punch the Nazi, am I automatically making a declaration that, hey, you know, everything's relative. What's right for you is right for you, even if it's not right for me. I accept you. I think your ideas have merit. I mean, if I don't haul off and use violence, am I sending the message or signal that, hey, you're good. You know, I'm good. You're good. We're all good. Kumbaya. And of course, I think this is completely wrongheaded. It reveals a presumptuous declaration by the promoters of violence that anybody who's not out there landing blows and throwing firebombs and breaking glass and trying to physically push hate speech out of the spotlight has adopted this sort of hey, let's hold hands, I'd like to buy the world a Coke mentality, where we all lock arms shoulder to shoulder and sing warm, fuzzy songs and gaze up to the stars and expect the world to change for the better. Sometimes you got to get dirty, they say. Sometimes you got to get down in the mud. Sometimes you got to get violent. Nobody's saying there isn't a time for a physical response. Now, if someone moves from words and attitudes into the arena of action, threatening action, against me? What's my response? Well, there will be a physical reaction. There will be even a violent, perhaps even lethal reaction from anyone who was trying to protect life and limb. And I think that's an appropriate response. I had somebody on Facebook ask me what my perspective was on the non-aggression principle. Well, I think there is time for aggression. If you see a dangerous or even lethal force coming after you, the response might be violence. Unfortunate, but sadly necessary violence to protect life and limb. But the idea that there are not strong alternatives to violence when it comes to hate speech, to me, is just hugely wrongheaded. It's a false narrative being promoted by those, I think, who want to excuse physical violence. I had commented on social media last week with this. I said the rationalizations for responding to hate speech with physical violence reveal, I think, a desire to surrender to baser instincts and frame this acting out as a kind of courageous intervention. Those declaring that a sentence spoken is the equivalent of a bullet fired seem alarmingly at ease with the idea of subjectively meted out mob justice. And this way, madness lies. There's another use of language I think's dishonest or at least clumsily used. It's the claim that... The person calling themselves a Nazi or branded by someone else as a Nazi, the person, the white supremacist, waving a swastika flag or holding a parade in favor of white supremacy or giving a TV interview, is the very same as the Nazis of Hitler's Germany, marching outward in a hail of bullets and bombs in the name of actual military conquest to the advocates of the punching of Richard Spencer. The words might as well be bullets. They are violent words. And... Therefore, we have to defend ourselves. And I think it's a clumsy attempt by the reactionary to justify the fact that people just want to surrender to emotion. You know, it sure would feel good. Let's lash out with physical force. Let's show them. Let's make them afraid. And of course, if you declare that you are not inclined to respond to someone's words with your fists, they say you're either a Nazi sympathizer or you're just weak or ambivalent. You're part of the problem. History is filled with the names of people who were anything but weak, 
anything but ambivalent. But they put themselves on the line for the cause of good and for justice, for the cause of better ideas. I mean, was it one year before the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation on public buses was unconstitutional? Rosa Parks made history by simply, peacefully, defiantly, courageously refusing to give up a seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, was Rosa Parks weak because she didn't smash the windows and tear out the seats and punch the white passenger trying to unseat her over the injustice of it all? Can you think of a more abhorrent band of agitators than the folks over at Westboro Baptist Church? Just horrible people promoting horrible ideas. They are the epitome of ugliness. Yet, how many times do we hear stories about how Westboro's presence was minimized or rendered completely impotent by people who didn't use violence? They just countered bad ideas with better ones. They showed up in greater numbers and they stood together arm in arm, and they promoted the ideas of acceptance and love, showing the world how it ought to be done. And they didn't delve into riots and chaos, which is what Westboro wants anyway, right? I mean, they're aching for a physical response so they can cry victim and they can instigate litigation against someone. Now, violence is a win-win for Westboro Baptist Church. I got a friend... He rides a Harley Davidson. This was years ago. Westboro Baptist Church was going to protest the funeral of some fallen soldier, someone who'd been killed in battle. And my buddy and his friends all rode their motorcycles up to the funeral. And what they did was, and there must have been a ton of them, they just encircled the area where the mourners and the family and friends had come together to honor this man. And whenever Westboro tried to shout and carry on, The men and women perched on their motorcycles just revved the throttle just a little bit. They just sat there quietly, peacefully, yet strongly, and whenever Westboro started to scream, they would just rev the engine just enough so you couldn't hear one syllable they were saying. And Westboro finally just gave up and went home. It's beautiful. And it's a show of strength and solidarity and compassion and better ideas. Not one fist was clenched, not one punch was thrown, not one bottle was thrown through a window, not one torch was lit. These people came together and displayed in a very strong, even defiant way that, hey, we as a society stand against you and we won't put up with you. But they never resorted to unprovoked violence. And by unprovoked, I mean no one had instigated violence against them. They were responding to unwelcome interlopers at an event that Westboro was not invited to or welcome at, and they took them right out of the equation. Hell, you want to see somebody completely rendered impotent without violence? Watch how the people at places like Comic-Con and elsewhere use humor. They make their own signs. They show up in costume. They just hang out and stand in close proximity to Westboro. And without one punch, without one finger raised, they completely devastate their credibility. It's awesome. Remember the story of the KKK parade? I forget what city it was happening in. And one guy decided his way of countering this awful display of racism and discrimination was to walk, I guess, 50 feet behind the parade with a tuba. So as they're holding all their signs saying white power and they're holding out their swastikas and they're promoting all this horrible stuff, the guy's walking peacefully right behind the parade going boom, 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 boom. And what happens? The racists become a complete laughingstock, and all the power they thought they had completely vanishes. And what they thought was going to be a show of strength ended up being a joke where they were the punchline. That punchline, the only punch thrown. That's awesome. Every day, you and I are confronted with horrible ideas that share the umbrella of constitutional protection. Just a few blocks down the street from my house, there's a Christian children's pastor at this big church, teaching impressionable, vulnerable children who've been brought there by their parents, who they trust, and teaching these kids to do what? To question their own worth and value, to believe they are inherently sinful, to distrust science and scientists, to distrust their own minds, to live their lives in fear of the devil. They learn how to discriminate against people of other sexual orientation or even other denominations. 
other cultures, other nations, whatever, and to enslave themselves to a debunked, a long debunked mythology. And we know it's abhorrent. We know this is psychological abuse. We know this needs to be countered and defeated. But we don't win the war of ideas by punching the Sunday school teacher or taking a torch to the building. That's not how we in a free and civilized society beat bad ideas with better ideas, not with shouts and shattered glass. We don't reduce ourselves to the point where we can't temper our outrage with maturity, consideration, compassion, and the awareness that the promotion of better ideas almost always, if not always, has a tactical advantage from the higher ground. And there's another issue that's been brought up that doesn't fit into a cookie cutter. It's this notion that the spreading of horrible ideas, bad speech, hate speech, is the equivalent of an incitement to violence. And again, especially in the Twitter wars, nuance is just gone dead out the window. And a big group of people are hugely eager to declare that a statement of white supremacy by the KKK, that statement is in itself a call for whites to declare war, a physical war upon non-whites. But it's just not that simple. Richard Spencer holds some horrible ideas, but his speaking, communicating in front of a camera lens is not the equivalent of the burning of a black church in South Carolina or the lynching of a Jewish immigrant in Atlanta, or the murder of a civil rights activist by sniper rifle in Mississippi. Now, the former may inform the latter, but we live in a free speech culture where we do not carry out violence against those who are still operating in the arena of language and ideas. And if someone does, in fact, incite others to violence directly, we have the law. We have the agents of law enforcement and a system designed for the protection of the innocent, which allows us to deal with the agents of incitement without becoming a lynch mob ourselves. And the fact that the system is imperfect doesn't excuse people who are so thin-skinned that they feel they have to heckle and shout down other constitutionally protected speech for the sake of the rest of us. I don't think the language of people like Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos or Ann Coulter or others itself constitutes violence. Speech is not violence or that the proportional response to, quote, verbal violence is physical violence. I think that's just a hugely subjective minefield. I agree with Penn Gillette, who said the solution to bad speech is more speech, better speech. Ann Coulter writes a horrible book. Actually, she's got many of them. We analyze the book, we dismantle its claims. Milo Yiannopoulos, given a platform by an institution we think ought to know better? Fine, we write our letters of protest, we join the faculty's petition. We stand peacefully yet defiantly with those law-abiding protesters on the corner with our signs and our placards and our voices, and we expose the toxicity, we bullhorn our own better messages with a rally of our own. We can decry the invitation by Berkeley as a misguided idea, or we can support their decision to invite whoever they want, just as we can decide to attend or not attend and loudly declare why. Welcome to the United States of America. Richard Spencer spouts racist ideas. We have a right to broadcast his venom in close-up. Or we can turn our cameras off entirely. But we don't join these people in the gutter. Nor do we give him a convenient opportunity to build more celebrity upon the platform of greater controversy, which is what so many of them are aching for. Punches landed, rocks thrown, fires set, damage done. We should be better than this, and I think we can be. You and I live in a society where ideas are heard. They get to be heard. They must be heard. And we don't encourage a culture where we censor each other under threat of violence using guidelines that just drift subjectively from one person to another. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous quote, I think, holds true today. He said, if there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Earlier in the broadcast, I mentioned the story of Stephen Fry, charged by somebody in Ireland who felt that he had overstepped the line. Well, I'm going to play a soundbite to close the show from a friend of Stephen Fry, the late Christopher Hitchens. 
He was speaking at the University of Toronto at the Hart House Debating Club in November of 2006. They were debating the motion, freedom of speech includes the freedom to hate. I exempt myself from the speaker's kind offer of protection that was uh, so generously proffered at the opening of this evening. Anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so. And welcome, in fact, at their own risk. And, uh, but before they do that, they must have taken, as I'm sure we all should, a short refresher course in the classic texts on this matter, which are John Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica being the great hill of Athens for discussion and free expression, um, Thomas Paine's introduction to the Age of Reason, and I would say a John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, in which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. Indeed, as John Stuart Mill said, if all in society were agreed on the truth and beauty and value of one proposition, all except one person, it would be most important, in fact, it would become even more important that that one heretic be heard because we would still benefit from his perhaps outrageous or appalling view. In more modern times, this has been put, I think, best by a personal heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, who said that the freedom of speech is meaningless unless it means the freedom of the person who thinks differently. And that's the show today. I'm so glad you were here. So glad you listened. I hope the conversation about free speech will continue out there. I'll see you on the road over the coming days. So the show will air as scheduled next week. It's a conversation between myself and someone who's been doing some Old Testament studies. Her name is Andrea Garrichan. She's got some interesting insight into the biblical Satan in a show that I have titled The Devil You Don't Know. We're going to talk about the devil next week. And I'll see you back here on the radio. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com